against the general public are coming in through here, yeah. through this door, yes. Right. Okay. In the normal run of things, that door would be open, obviously. Right. Uh, well, the first thing is that we've, it's pretty self evident that the exhibition is upstairs, but there'll be somebody here on the door uh, for obvious reasons. Because we've got lists, there's a guest book, not really sure why we're doing that. But, uh, but the first thing that people will encounter is Pierce's uh, light work. You know, that's all LEDs, it's a slow program. It's, it's, it's there because we had it around and it was a, a sort of adjunct to the show. It was just to make things more engaging, more delightful. Anyway, the show's upstairs, so if we go up this way. And one of the first pieces in the show is a painting called The Field Next to Tesco's, which is going to be built on number four, um, and it's the coupling of, I mean, ha I've written about Hannah's work before, and, and she, when she was a student at the Royal College and I was a professor, she was in the sculpture department making signs that stood, <laughs> like, like little signs with text on that had wheels to be moved around and were meant to describe or inform. They were, there was something didactic about them and quite absurd as well, in a sense. But they, so she, like a lot of the people in the show, uh, not only have absorbed sort of the discourse that you know commonly called conceptualism, but she her work would be described by most people as conceptual art. But out of that uh, came this take on the traditional and particularly the traditions of East Anglia with Constable Crow and, and Gainsborough and all the rest of them. Okay, so that's the first piece, and it's oil on board. Uh, what we'll do is, if I think we'll walk around in the number that they're done, yes. And the second piece is, and remember the show, it's all about painting as a discourse, it's the potential spread and the range of painting, it's not painting as an activity. Which I'm much more interested in the idea of painting as a discourse, informed by the legacy of conceptual art and the history of painting per se. Anyway, uh, this, was, this is by Claire Mitten, <laughs> it's Oh, it's pretty obviously a, is it three or three, four times life-size cardboard model of a Casio, a very early Casio watch, but it sits on a cutting mat, one of these green plastic cutting mats, but that's been reduced in scale by six-fold, so the relationship between that and that is 24 to 1, if you see what I mean. That's 24 times bigger comparatively. But, so it looks like a monumental sort of, you know, like a study for an Oldenburg piece in a, in a city square or whatever. Um, what's, what I think is marvellous about this is, is it reminds me of the kind of um, rather sort of wonderfully democratic introduction to art and craft that Blue Peter and things like that always kind of signal and flag up. The idea of doing something with your hands, being occupied, rather than being entertained all the time. Uh, and it, it's... I, I, I'm absolutely adamant that I don't know how these watches work and I'm damn sure that Claire doesn't either. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's the second piece. The third piece, which again is a constructed piece, and this is, a guy, this is by a, a guy called Will Turner. Now, Will was in the painting school probably about when I first got there, over 20 years ago. Um, and I have, some, I have some pieces of his work. All of this is done with Chromalux card. Uh, and for me, it has echoes of that wonderful um, Martin Scorsese magical realist film, Hugo, about the boy who is, I suppose, an orphan, but lives in the clock in um, one of the railway stations in, um, is it Gare du Nord or Saint-Germain in, um, or do I say, I never know which one, one of the stations in Paris, but it's obviously a fantastic late 19th century uh, romp with that. Actually, we might as well go around this room whilst we're in it. Um, and this is a piece by a guy called James Wright. Uh, when, at first glance, it's called The Confessor. I'm not going to get into the sort of why people call things things because I can't, I, can't, I can't actually explain or justify other people's actions and nor am I going to. But the thing that fascinates me about this is that when you look at the right-hand part, I mean, it's pretty self-evident that the left-hand panel is self-signifying, yeah? It's, it's sort of non-referential, it's, it's non-figurative there. But the piece on the right is clearly figurative, 
And I don't see that as, as a difference, I see it's just a matter of range. But the one thing that's curious about this piece is it would probably go under the umbrella sort of description of photorealism. But when you actually look at the piece, you suddenly realise that it's all small brush strokes. And my goodness, it, like a lot of the work in the show, it's about precision, it's about a particular state of mind, the idea of being conscious, being aware of what you're doing whilst you're doing it, sort of self-remembering or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so it's his work, and, and I have some of his drawings in, indoors, this guy's work epitomises the idea that the obsessive compulsive, as it's called, is, is no, it, it's not a problem. It's probably empowering if you're going to paint or you're going to make stuff. The sort of people that get up early and work all hours. This is a piece by Bill Fever. Uh, Bill used to be the arts reviewer or critic of The Observer uh, until, I don't know, about 15 or more years ago, quite a while ago. But he was there for quite a while and would regularly write reviews. And, um, and he's obvious, he is a painter as well as a writer. And I think that's to his credit. That's what makes him a more um, reflective and a more, not necessarily generous, but a better informed reviewer and describer. Or um, his, his analysis of painting is not simply from the, from the historical or the theoretical or the socio-political. It's also from experience. And that's from the northeast of England somewhere. This is, <laughs> this is one of my pieces. Uh, this is called Grey Mooring 2. And it's... I feel I've got to explain it, but in, in short, it's very much about illusion, about fiction. But, but at the same time, I'm taking a very, very... Like Hannah, I'm taking a very familiar genre, i.e. landscape, but trying to reinvent it, yeah, to rethink it. Um, yeah, and, and the language I use is one of, of, of the graphic, you know, it's common to things like graphic novels. It's a contemporary language of, of, in the visual arts. Uh, and and it's, it's made in a very, very um, disciplined and schematic way. So, it, and it involves a lot of what's called glazing, which is something that was obviously uh, out of fashion for years, not something that people talked about because they were rather more concerned, you know, in, in, during the, uh, the reign of modernism, as it were, with being true to themselves and uh, expressing their feelings. And you think, well, good luck with that. So that's, that's my piece in the show. And here we go. This, this incidentally, is... The original coach house has just been refurbished, but this is the studio in which I work, and and I think the the majority of works in here because it's a larger space. Um, the first piece is by Ansel Crutt. It's untitled. Uh, I, I I've known Ansel Crutt since he was a student. He came from South Africa in the I think around about 1980 and studied at the Royal College of Art under Peter de Francia. Um, this, this is one of the earliest pieces of his work that's currently uh, being widely received uh, and, and showing a hell of a lot of work all over the world. Uh, his, I think his work is magnificent. It's a curious kind of... It's got a sense of the contemporary. Uh, it would be... Sometimes to use the word cartoon is to sort of um, somehow dismiss a, a work or, um, I don't know undermine, or yes, to dismiss, but in actual fact, as I say, same as in my work, the idea of the graphic contemporary, it's the, it's the lingua franca, it's, it's how we see the world, how the world is described to us, particularly in the graphic novels. Okay, and this is a piece by a man called John Strutton, and uh, this was, John ran a, a performance band, which is the antithesis of so-called performance art. This was 70 people dressed in spray suits, uh, with orange faces, uh, <laughs> and, or and some of them had orange spray suits on, and they, they, tr they, they were a band of Oompa Loompas, basically, okay, and half of them had acoustic guitars, some of which were painted like this, all painted by John, I hasten to add, and uh, in enamels, and the other half, or th 40 of them, would be playing kazoos, 
and they, their repertoire was wonderful. It was the antithesis of kind of touchy, feely, sort of precious, sort of um, balletic performance art. They, they would all appear, uh, you know, at, at various events and venues, sometimes unannounced, because the, the idea of intervention was really exciting. And they'd start to play The Clash's White Riot <laughs> in a really cacophonous, uh, sort of Portsmouth Symphonia type sort of way. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's John's piece. This is a piece by Justin, Justin Hibbs. Um, now, uh, Justin's work, his, his work is, this is pretty indicative, but what he does is, in the, in the case here, he's found a catalogue of, uh, I think they were fabric samples, but maybe you can speak to him later about that. And this is wonderful because it's about the ageing of a piece of paper. This piece of paper is at least 100, maybe 120 years old, right? The piece of work on it is probably 20 days old. Um, and it's about becoming uh, sensitive to the nuance of things. But of course, the other thing, the other reason that I'm really excited to have it in the show is because it's not about a style, this show. It's about a set of values. It's about the idea that things have changed. It's not conceptual art versus painting. Painting has absorbed, as it always will, just about everything that kind of, what should we say, comes in its path. It will sort of consume it and embrace it. And, and this is about embracing the idea of ideas, as it were. And oh, of course, there's lots of art historical quotes. It's definitely not the blue of Eve Klein. It's a totally different, I mean, his was mixed, allegedly. Uh, but there's something pure and still. And this is pretty much broadly what I re refer to, not as abstract, but as non-referential art, okay? It, it is self-signifying, it's, it's not about you know, the sky or the sea or Matisse's blue and all that, although art historically there are echoes of that. But it's about being its own object, take it or leave, as they say. This piece is a painting by Julian Perry and uh, Julian's work deals in an, a, a wonderfully unsensational way with something profoundly important. He lives part of the year, has a house in Dunwich, and anybody who knows anything about the East Coast or coastal erosion knows that Dunwich was a very, very large place with, I don't know, half a dozen churches, 50 pubs, and God knows how many houses in the 19th century. Well, all that was left was half a graveyard and, you know, one pub, eventually, now, and, and one row of cottages. And so this is very much, it, uh, it's something that has been seen. That's what's marvellous about this. Uh, but then it's contextualised in this... Uh, thematic and abstract space. So it's called, I think it's called Studio Tree, yeah, because it's observed, but then rethought and reworked in studio. Anyway, that's that, and, and that's uh, Julian's piece. Julian has co-curated the show with me. Uh, last year it was John Stark, uh, this year it's Julian. And both of them have connections with East Anglia, and both of them are painters. And, right, this piece is called Bread of Heaven, it's by Sue Williams of Court, and I'm not sure whether you can get a shot as close to that, but it looks, I mean, the, the, it's a common prayer book, probably around about the end of the 19th century. Um, it, it's obviously aged, it's, it's well used, I think is the expression, yeah, you can, it's got that sort of patina from sweaty palms, as it were. Um, probably, you know, guilt or something, I expect, on the part of the person holding it. Um, and inside is this diamond-type lozenge, well, it's not diamond shape, it's a lozenge shape. And in it is a characteristic take on a um, idyllic, the idea of Eden, the idea of redemption, in, and this sort of peaceful, happy valley that's always promised in, in most world religions. Um, it, I think it's just an exquisite piece. And the idea that a book cover can be a support, the way a guitar can be a support for paint, it, it, it's, it's not that innovative. I mean, people have been painting on things like cigar boxes, early Jackson Pollock, probably, I think one of the earliest, or one of Thomas Hart Benton's pieces, Thomas Hart Benton was Jackson Pollock's teacher. Uh, they would work on cigar boxes in the 30s, 40s and 50s. 
And, uh, and the idea of the decorated guitar, I mean, that's a really, um, what do you say, that, that, that's quite a conventional, that's a convention in rock music particularly, and in skiffle and blues and jazz and so on. Anyway, Bread of Heaven, right? The next piece, ha, is, is this little beauty. This, it's, quite, it's kind of sort of, if I tell you the title, it, it, it's by Hester Finch, right? And it has the title, and this is what's rather like Hannah Brown's rather sort of descriptive title as a statement of affairs, right? Rather than, a, you know, the field next to Tesco's which is going to be built on, I think that's the title of Hannah's number four. This has this wonderful sort of, uh, she, she's used a title that would be more appropriate to a kind of um, uh, an award at the Academy, Royal Academy Schools in the 1920s. It's called The Portrait of a Lady, brackets red, grey and blue or something, pur purple, grey and blue, close brackets. And you think, <laughs> what? It, it's, that's not clearly, that's, it, you know, this is messing with your head as they say, right? This is, and, and that's exactly what's problematic about it. It's a really, really curious, absurd, but exquisitely executed uh, um, conundrum. It's, you know, the idea of the, the, the I mean, life drawing, it's, it's, I mean, again, that's another documentary, but basically um, the trying to paint from life these days in the life room context or something that looks more like a domestic interior is problematic. It's not only is it well trodden like landscape, the idea of reinventing or rethinking it creates more of a challenge than expressing yourself, which I think is a cop-out, okay? Right. Next piece is, and now, the, now these are, and, and if you look around the room, just if you do a pan of the room, you'll see there's a pair of pictures, another pair of pictures, a constructed piece, and this, this cluster of three. And the thing about these three, apart from being similar sizes, etc., this is by Luke. Louisa Chambers, and her work, the, the thing that really, that I find enchanting is the fact that this is playful. There is a joyousness, there's something celebratory about her work. And the idea of uh, celebration in painting or celebration in art generally is tends to be um, dismissed. You know, play is for children, play is childlike. Well. That's how you may see it, that's not how Louisa sees it, that's not how I see it. And this is by a piece by a woman called Pippa Gatti. Pippa lives up in the, uh, is it Sky? Somewhere in the Inner Hebrides, anyway. Um, she has a craft background, I think she was a gilder, she's amazingly um, gifted. And this painting, if it's anything, is a riff on those wonderful tiny goyas of those abject figures in caves lost in some sort of psychic limbo. And here, whether they're figures, what it is, it's at the edge of figuration. Everything is about to become. Everything, it's transformative in terms of imagination as well as imagery. This little piece is by Sally, Sally Crowley, and it's, I, it's, it's a piece of lava, a, a study of a piece of lava, ostensibly, but the piece of lava, it's I think it is an Icelandic word, and it's A, or capital A, apostrophe, small a, and then there's a kind of um, circumflex or some, I don't know, something over the top. I don't know what the hell that's called. I can't find it on my computer, so I couldn't put it on the list properly. So it's A, apostrophe, A, A, lava, not an lava, or A, lava, A, lava, and it is literally, uh, again, uh, just a, a beautiful uh, and exquisite piece of something that is kind of observed. Now, that's what's really interesting, the idea that it's kind of observed. So what's really important is the way in which it's observed, not the fact it's mimetic. So, you know, that is not how the lava necessarily looks. If you want to record what a piece of lava looks, you'll do what most scientists do, or most geologists do, you'll photograph it. But once you start drawing it and you're studying it, you see it differently. You create something other. Now, this is, this is a piece by Freddie Robbins. Um, and 
to say it's nasty would probably be, uh, would, would, I mean, Freddie would be delighted because it would, you know, nasty knitting is a kind of, uh, what should we say, not a genre that has really had enough exposure in, in media in general. Um, this is pieces called Bad Mother. I mean, it's self-evident, it's written on it. And it, it has all the hallmarks of fetish. The idea of needles, <laughs> I, I mean, the theatre of it. I mean, it is, it's sort of, it's kind of, um, it's psycho meets kind of Women's Weekly sort of thing. It really is a, a proper cultural hybrid. Uh, and to say a nasty piece of work would be an accolade. Um, so it's, it's got things like this funny uh, crochet type knitting. I think it's called, is it Swiss knitting? Made through a cotton reel. So it has, again, something of that homespun, literally handmade sort of cottage industry sort of air about it. Anyway, so that, that's Freddie Robbins' piece. This piece is, it's called Twin Orbs, right? And every time I show it to people, they can't work out where the work is. You know, like, well, she's just like torn a page out of a book, isn't she? It's obvious. Now, if that isn't uh, informed by some form of idea uh, driving the work, I don't know what is. And it, literally, I showed this to some, uh, some people who came yesterday, and it took them a good, I don't know, several minutes. In fact, it got to the point where I had to say, look, forget I ever asked you what's there. I'll tell you what she's done, OK? And that's what I'll do now. It's basically, Sasha has torn a page, well, cut a page very neatly out of an old art history book, right? This is a study from a court painting from the Spanish court in the 17th century, right? Um, <laughs> oh, you've also got to realise that Sasha has a background as a, uh, a restorer of paintings. And I've written about uh, Sasha's work. And one of the things I said was, if, if she were still a restorer of paintings, you'd, you, you'd find it, you'd, find, you'd be very disappointed because it, it's the idea that somebody took a picture to her and then she thought, no, I, I really don't think this is good enough. I'll do what so-and-so really meant was this and change it willfully, not restore it, but make another piece out of it. And that's the kind of, wrong-headedness, if you like, or at a professional level, that has been harnessed to make this piece. And, and it's literally, headedness is the clue. So these are two infanta, two of the children from the court. Um, and <laughs> what she does very, very carefully and very cleverly, seamlessly, with oil paint, is to remove and repaint huge sections of the painting, of the original, the, sorry, the lifo, because it's an offset lifo image, and then introduce sometimes in, in as far as is possible, in a very sympathetic style, she emulates the period and the style. It's as if she is restoring a painting that never existed. It's that sort of idea. And then there's these curious uh, surrealist subversions of the piece. I, I think that is absolutely delightful because you know, the question is, so where's the work? It's in every fibre of that. It's, it's wonderful. This is a piece by a woman called Covadonga Valde. Um, Covadonga just had a show at the Terps Gallery uh, a few weeks ago, uh, which is where I first saw this piece. And there is, a, and this is what's lovely about the work, there is what, what's called a quiet poetry, right? Nothing extreme, very quiet, very, very modest means. In fact, this, by the way, listen, it's painted on aluminium uh, because the support these days for painting, I mean, it's not just canvas, it's not just linen, it's not just bits of board. But as I say, it can, you know, a lot of people are using copper, um, aluminium, and so on as a support. Right, and, and Covadonga uses aluminium. And it's, it's painted in oil paints on, on aluminium. And it is of a tree that has obviously fallen in a storm into some water. Whether it's flooded, we're, it, we're not given that information. We can only conjecture. We build this sense of place. Whether it's a drama, the, or it's the kind of fallout of some cataclysmic event, we're not sure. But of course, what's happened is as she's painted it, and then painted something that approaches or approximates to a reflection, she suddenly realised that there's something haunting her about this image. And when you turn through 90 degrees, you can see that it's actually the vascular system of, of, of a heart, right? So the title of this piece is, why I didn't tell you first, is Vascular, Heart.
any of that's Val, uh, Covadonga Valdez. This is a piece by Annabelle Dover. Annabelle recently did a residency in the Athens, the British school in Greece. Uh, and while she was there, I mean, obviously, you know, it's like the British school at Rome, British school in Greece. You're surrounded by antiquities, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the, the, the schools are dominated, unsurprisingly, by um, archaeology and archaeologists, but there are fine artists there. Anyway, Annabelle did a residency, a short residency there recently. And one thing that fascinated her, apart from the um, artifacts, the statuary and all that, the, the obvious, was the actual materials. And this, it's very difficult to see, but it's actually ground mica that she's then made the paint from, the pigment from. So it's sort of, it's watercolour, as in gum arabic and stuff like that. But then it's ground to a paste using ground mica. So from various angles, this looks gold, then it looks green, then it becomes silver and blue. I mean, it's mica, most of the image. Some of it is just plain watercolour and body colour, as they say. But it, it, it looks, <laughs> to all intents and purposes, like a kind of Neolithic jelly baby or a kind of sort of rather clunky first stab at a glove puppet. It's, it's something kind of absurd and spare and forlorn about it. And I, I find that rather touching. Anyway. Now, uh, this piece, which has foxed a lot of people, and I, I mean, once you know how it's done, I mean, I think most people will realise how this is done. The first question, it's by Jane Ward, by the way, and it's called Bridges. Um, uh, it's, I'll come to it in a minute. And a lot of people say, oh, my goodness, how ever, you know, must take hours and hours, all that sort of seeing it uh, sort of uh, refracted through a work ethic or being kind of staggered by the minutiae. I mean, Jane Ward takes things at, at scale. She, she makes cornfields out of thousands, I mean, literally tens of thousands of street lamps so, uh, that blow in the wind, as it were. There is something magically transformative about her work. The thing that is more matter of fact is this is a, com it will come as no surprise to a lot of people, it's a computer generated uh, piece. It's, uh, it's a, a inkjet print on, on uh, treated cotton. But the thing that's really, really exciting is the idea of every, every so often, th th there is a, a it's, it's as if there's a virus in it sort of thing, literally in, in our looking, because just as you're about to focus on something, and I find it difficult focusing on this because of the minutiae, the miasma, uh, is that it looks as if there's something is eroded, it's rotting away. It's atrophying. It's kind of, and in fact, if you look carefully, there are there are skyscraper blocks. Everything is used or repurposed in this work, uh, and it, and it's a print. It's uh, an edition of five, and this is one of them. Uh, Jane is currently in Switzerland doing a residency there. Anyway, that's everybody that's in the show. Fantastic. Good. That's brilliant. I mean, Thank that's, you. Like I say, I think as a standalone piece. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. Really yeah, 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 I was just going to say, it, and it also, it's about explaining, not mystifying. Yeah. It's about yeah. demystifying. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Okay, let's knock this off for a while till people come.